The oldest? Bobbity squeaked. This has to be some kind of sick mistake. I am the oldest. I'm the original. I was the one who took over when... Bobbity smiled patiently. Go on. The wizard had nearly collapsed on the sunbathing chair, barely maintaining a proper sitting position. He tried to utter something, but no words were coming to his mind. Only slight whimpers. It's not your fault, you know, Bobbity continued. Our father made sure that we wouldn't concern ourselves with anything but his goals. But if that will make you feel better, I think you were maybe second oldest. Hey, congratulations. You have yourself a silver medal, my chum. How many more are there? The potato scratched his head, kind of overwhelmed. He knew that Bibbidi was using them, but he always thought about himself as the successor. All of this, it was a lot to take. Let me think. Along with the one that has been awakened right now, at least three more? But he might have drained some of them of power. I'm not quite sure. He can do that? Can I do that? Well, kind of. But you figured it out for yourself, haven't you? Once we no longer see fit to his vision, he just goes and wakes up the next one. Technically, you know about the others already, but the imprinted memories tell you that they are a safety measure in case of your demise. But wait, where are we exactly? Is it still Planet Dorella? And where are Piccolo and Gia? Bobbity looked around, taking in the serene scenery around him, which did not resemble the stormy, desolate world that he remembered landing on. You know, I found ways to make this place my own, I suppose. As for your friends, well, they are outside currently of the habitable zone, but they seem tough. They'll be fine. What do you mean they will manage? Listen, chum, I'm here because one of our siblings has joined forces with the Planet Eater Moro. His older brother sighed slightly. Oh, so he eventually found a way out, huh? That was unavoidable in a way. Well, good thing that we're safe here. I don't think you'll ever want to consume this planet. <laughs> Bad indigestion. But that was our father's main workshop. There has to be something here that would help us fight these two, surely. But why would you fight? You can't hope to stop Moro. Last time it took ages to even contain him. Besides, um, trying it um, is complicated. What? What is it? What is it that you're telling me? Bobby seemed irritated. Well, you know how Morrow taught our father everything he knew, right? Bobbity then placed a hand on Bobbity's shoulder. Well, that includes creating us, the homunculi. You see, that's how Bibbidi started himself. Bobbity's bulgy eyes blinked twice. You mean to tell me that the great wizard Bibbidi was... was... A familiar face of Morrow the Planet Eater, yes. But no, he he recognized me. Yes, he would have. <laughs> he probably was amused that his homunculus created his own copies. He did not feel threatened by him in any way. And a, a margin symbol, what does that mean? Bobbity shrugged. Oh yes, that probably was the original sigil of Morrow, probably just rebranded after the Galactic Patrol captured his master and started his own crusade. Got all crazy about that March and Boo thing, too. My point is, my friend, is that you cannot fight our own creator. He'll always be smarter and more powerful than us. Leave that to the Patrol and other strong people to tackle. They'll find a way. There's no point getting into a stress about it. So, that was it, thought Barbadie? Was he just a copy of someone's pet? Created for a whim? A backup for a servant? Was this whole expedition pointless then? Barbadie looked at the sea. You know, you can always stay here with me. I can always do with company. I'm not as magical as I once was, but I have become rather crafty with all of those magical gadgets my father left behind. This little paradise is, as you can see, quite relaxing. Bobbity tried to comfort his sibling. There was a moment of silence broken only by the waves and seagull-like birds flying around in repeatable patterns, clearly a programmable loop. Bobbity could swear that he saw the same crab walking over to him for the fifth time, the exact same way. 
everything was serene, but it wasn't real. This wasn't a paradise. This was a self-inflicted escapist prison. No. Well, what do you mean, no? Uh, it's not safe outside, Bobbity. I've been in worse situations before, Bobbity. I learned how to do magic without our father's power there, faced insane deities, and saved many universes. I am the great wizard Bobbity, and I am the one deciding about my future. You can join me if you want, or if not, get out of my way. Where is, um, where are those magical gadgets anyway? Where is the workshop? But brother, I, I beg you to reconsider. Tell me where it is, Bobbity, or I will turn you into a desk made out of mahogany and give you over to King Yemma. The older of the brothers looked rather unhappy, but then pointed toward a nearby cliff. It was disguised quite well. If he hadn't have told him, he probably would have spent ages looking for the damn thing. After a good few minutes of checking the rocky wall for any specific thing with his hands, he then finally found an invisible handle and then the hidden room. On the screens, he could see the real appearance of the paradise island. It seemed that what it actually was, was a magical dome that was covering a lone fragment of land on the planet. The magic to protect this place had been drained from the world itself, so in theory, as long as the planet was intact, it could last forever. So their father had learned a few tricks from Morrow after all. Now the workshop seemed to be underneath, but the dome was protecting the entrance. Well, Bobbity would just have to do without his precious beach. Before his older sibling could protest, the wizard then turned it off, revealing the windy and ravaged landscape. Come in, brave little wizard! Can you hear us? That was Gia's signal in the air. Y yes, yes, I can hear you. Sorry for the radio silence. Uh, I found what we came here for. Well, that and another survivor. I am sending you the coordinates right now. I hope you're happy. Barbadie seemed hurt and right now pretty cold because of his paradise island disappearing. The two of them now noticed a gigantic hatch, which without a doubt was leading to their father's main workshop. Hey, you can always come and fly to Earth with us. It has real beaches, you know, not fake ones. And not all of them have seagulls. Dreadful creatures. Soon enough, Piccolo and Gia had landed. It seemed that the ship had sustained a notable amount of damage, but guessing from its shape, the patroller had made some quick fixes. Piccolo raised an eyebrow while he saw the two of them. Oh, great. Another one? Yeah, not. Nah, this one's retired. Hello, I am Bobbity. Your father didn't have great imagination when it came to names, then. Yours called himself and every one of you after wooden instruments, so pot, meat, kettle. It's still more creative than just changing a single letter. I don't want to hasten you, my feisty comrades, but the conditions on this planet are beginning rather dire. Julia interrupted their banter rather quickly. Right, we need to check the workshop. Bobbity nodded. I still doubt you'll find anything useful there. His brother scratched the bald part of his head. Piccolo gave him a passing look. Let us be the judges of that. As they got to the hatch, it required them to scan the hand of one of the siblings. Barbadi ordered the older sibling to do so, and indeed, it opened without a problem, revealing an elevator that greatly resembled his old ship in the overall stylistic sense. As he stepped inside, they noticed that the storm outside had become quieter and quieter, the walls seemingly quite durable. They were clearly meant to last through various natural disasters, even before Durella spiraled into what it is today. For Barbadi, the interior seemed familiar, the same design as he had had in his former vessel or one of his laboratories. It's almost as if his father had put this particular architecture into his own mind that he would gravitate towards this design. Whatever the case was, the long forgotten complex did not have as many secrets as the wizard had initially hoped. A lot of the things that were hidden inside they already knew, starting from the absolute basics I wouldn't be too helpful, to the secrets of creating doppelgangers or homunculi, something that for now didn't seem required, and a brief history of the planet eater himself. Obviously, most of his past was shrouded in mystery, and a lot of his magical repertoire had already been seen. Barbadi discovered that the enemy was also capable of mind reading, magical ignition, creating magical copies of himself, absorbing other beings by swallowing them whole. Yikes. Voracious. 
and even empowering his minions by transferring his own power into them. So far, no mention of weaknesses or anything that could give Barbary an edge over him have been found. Well, that's all well and good, but it seems that your brother is right. There's nothing here. Piccolo crossed his arms, unimpressed. Wait, we haven't checked the entire thing. I'm sure we can get something out of it. I can feel it. Gia looked through some of the documents. Well, some of that stuff would be helpful to know when we first faced him all those millennia ago. Would it make, would it really make a difference? Barbadi looked around, reading the same scroll over and over. I am not sure, Brave Wizard, I wasn't there. As silly as it sounded, this armor-cladded fool might have given Barbadi a very good idea. What isn't here? Spells? Formulas? He remembered what was the key to defeating Moro in the first place. It came to him. The Grand Supreme Kai was locking his powers away. But this time, they didn't have that as there was only his mind inside the pink blob. Barbadi doubted that he was able to perform a ritual strong enough to cut the Ram Man from his powers, but the interesting lack of any notes about counter spells were rather interesting. He gathered all the books about creating your own magic and ordered Gia to dismantle a large portion of the machinery that was powering up the entire beach dome. The patroller didn't like the idea of staying on the planet longer than was necessary, but Piccolo could see that the wizard was hatching a plan. So, if I may, what are you doing? Improvising. I'm doing a Goku. Namekian raised an eyebrow. You're starting to worry me, Potato. Don't worry, I haven't gone mad if that's what you're thinking. But listen, Moro wants to increase his power by gnawing on the planet, yes? So, we shall give him a target to really sink his teeth into. And then what? There was a moment of awkward silence. Oh, yes. And then, 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 we'll find out if I'm a better wizard than my father. Yes. Piccolo nodded in agreement. If there's anyone who could pull this off, it's you. You, you, you mean that? This wasn't sarcasm or... A uh, backhanded compliment, yes? The Namekian shook his head. No, not at all. Seems like a solid plan. How about him? He pointed over to Bobbity, who was looking through some documents and disassembled parts himself. He knows those darn things like his own robe. I told him what he had to do. All right, gentlemen, we need to leave this place shortly, Gia said to them, looking at the storm and ravaging another rock away. Agreed. I think I have everything we need from here. Barbadi dug himself into the tomes aboard the ship. On their way to the HQ, they got some dire news. Morrow was now heading toward Earth. That's bad. I know that Gohan's preparing some sort of defense for us, but they really could use our help. Piccolo then looked at Gia. Can this thing fly faster? Master Piccolo, I am going as fast as I can. Meanwhile, the two brothers were working together. If Barbadi's plan was about to work, they had to figure some things out fairly quickly. Meanwhile, en route to Earth, Moro was enjoying his restored youth and power. He still wasn't quite as strong as he wanted to be, but still, he left his entire opposition behind. Debody, approach me, lad, he said while sitting on his throne, which had been placed at the bridge of the vessel. Yeah, great, Moro? The little tuft of hair on the top of his scalp was waving with excitement. You served me well, little homunculi. Uh, don't forget useful servants. But still, I think that your sibling may try something. How about we even the playing field, shall we? My, my master? Debody started, but the Ram Warlock placed his massive hand atop his head. He felt a sudden surge of power, a might that he had never dreamt of, drained from the hearts of the planet that they had ravaged together. Now he was sharing it with his master. This felt revitalizing. All those fools who were eaten, all those new possibilities were waiting to be unleashed. And how poetic. His first target was going to be his failed brother. Ebony couldn't wait for the final showdown. And that's where we're going to be leaving things for right now.